Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is January 10th, 2011, and my guest is Don Boudreau of George Mason University. Our topic for today is inflation and deflation. Don, welcome back to Econ Talk. Always good to be here, Russ. So first, let's talk about what is, when we talk about inflation, what, what is usually meant and what do we mean as economists? You asked the right question to begin. The, the definition of uh, inflation and deflation uh, the, those definitions have changed over time and have changed in ways that that are significant. Um, the original meaning of inflation was an increase in the money supply. And there are still a few people today who hold out for that definition. I'm much more of a spontaneous order guy when it comes to language. Words mean what people take them to mean. In fact, inflation today means to the average person who hears it and to the typical, even very well-informed professional economist who uses it, it means not an increase in the money supply. It means a sustained increase in the general price level, sustained increase in average prices. Um, but the it's important to re- remember what inflation originally meant because there's a connection, of course, between sure. changes in the money supply and changes in the price level. And similarly with, with deflation, deflation originally meant a decrease in the supply of, of circulating medium, and now it means a general decrease in the price level. Um, so. Let's start. Let's start with one of the common confusions, and of course, much of the confusion I think that there is about these two topics of inflation <clears throat> and deflation. Um, it's really one topic: the sort of the average level of prices and their movements. One of the sources of confusion is how the media writes about it, and I want to talk about two issues. Uh, One is they'll often talk about inflation in one price or deflation in one price. And generally, economists are very careful to distinguish between inflation, which is the average level of prices going up, as opposed to one particular price going up. So that's one important confusion that I think comes from the misuse of the word inflation in, in the media. Of course, the other is which is related, is the media often reports, and I guess the government sometimes collects or always collects, I don't know, um, the core level of inflation where they'll exclude certain goods. So I think the core level is the level of inflation not including energy prices and food, say, or I think is, is, is yeah, that the I don't underst- I've never understood that. It's a meaningless concept. Yeah. Now, look, and yet it's commonly used. So yeah. first – why, why is it a meaningless concept? Well, well let, let, let's, let's talk first about the, the first issue you raised, the difference between changes in the average level of prices, general level of prices, and changes in, in individual prices. It is important to distinguish between changes in individual prices or changes in one price relative to the price of, of something else and changes in the price level. The, the concept to keep your, our eye on is – is the is to ask we have to ask why does the price change inflation becomes salient becomes a meaningful and uh, uh, an and, and interesting concept to study when we recognize that prices are changing not because of any changes in real resource constraints real consumer demands in the economy real uh, uh, shifts in consumers' preferences for savings as opposed to to consumption, but change is simply caused by exogenous increases in the supply of money. That is inflation. You're correct. A lot of times people use the term inflation quite mistakenly to say to talk about individual price increases. Right? You know, well, the, the price of gasoline is inflating, right? or, the, the, or the, the price There's of been a lot of inflation in the energy sector this year. Yeah, that's that that's that's quite confusing and, and nonsensical talk. Uh, the the if what is meant by the term "there's been a lot of inflation in the energy sector this year" is simply meant that the price of energy has risen relative, relative to, to other goods. Yeah. All that means is 
that the supply of energy resources has fallen and or the demand for those resources has increased, which of course causes their relative price to increase and that their relative price should increase to reflect those underlying real changes in the economy. There's nothing about uh, changes in the money supply that we would expect to show up ex- you know, exclusively in the energy sector I think the part or any other individual sector for that matter. And similarly, the idea that they could somehow on their own ripple through the economy and cause inflation in the absence of a monetary shock, a monetary change would, is unlikely and, and not really economics the way we, you and I were taught it. Um, underlying all of what we're going to talk about today, I, I suspect, and you can correct me if you disagree, is the Milton Friedman sentence that inflation is – Everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. It used to be people were – had many, many theories as to why the average level of prices might increase or decrease. It may be one of the few, if not the only areas of economics where decisive empirical evidence established uh, a theory that virtually all economists, mainstream and out of the mainstream, accept. Um, there was – in the 60s, there was an idea of wage push or cost push inflation. Even to the 70s, yeah. Yeah, uh, this idea that unions could push up the price of labor and that since labor is in every commodity. And what the monetarists responded was, well, some prices will go up more than others uh, because of their labor component. But sectors that are not unionized would then have fall in- decreases in prices in the absence of a monetary change. So, again, just to take another example, I think you from the news, I think you often hear people say, well, what's this all this talk of inflation? TVs are getting cheaper. Mm-hmm. And TVs are, and other electronic goods, there's so much technological improvement in the production process of those goods that their relative price has fallen dramatically. Mm-hmm. Had there not been inflation, it would have fallen even more. If the average price level, the nominal price would have fallen. Even the further. nominal price would have fallen even more. If the average price level had been unchanging, that is, if there had been no inflation over the last twenty-five years, then the goods that had the most technological increases would have even bigger nominal, meaning the dollar amount that we actually see, that is not corrected for any kind of inflation. The actual number written on the price tag in America, say would be even lower. But if there's inflation, you could make enough inflation. If the money supply had increased enough over the last 25 years, you could have TVs and other goods getting more expensive in nominal terms, that is the price tag that was written, but relative to other things getting dramatically cheaper as they have Mm -hmm. because of those technological changes. Mm -hmm. That concept is very tricky. (laughs) It's hard, I think, for people who aren't used to thinking that way to see it, but that's the idea of how the real changes that you're talking about uh, get tangled up with these overall changes in the economy as whole prices as a whole because of changes in the money supply. Yeah, let, 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 let's let's base our discussion. You know, let's let's launch it as you propose on, from Milton Friedman's famous statement: "Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon." It does not mean, as a lot of people carelessly interpret it. To mean. It does not mean inflation is always and everywhere necessarily caused by an increase in the money supply. Uh, it can be caused by that. In fact, it's probably usually caused by that. But conceptually, it can also be caused by changes in money demand. Sure. Or bank behavior, regulations, all kinds of things. It- well, any, anything that causes the supply of circulating money to rise will cause inflation. And obviously, the most the most uh, 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 common way to do that is for the monetary authority to increase the supply of base money, to increase the supply of money, which will cause the banks to to expand uh, their loans, and the supply of money will increase. Uh, but it can also happen if consumers decide to to uh, uh, spend their money faster. In the in the there's something economists have called the equation of exchange. Uh, it, you know, it's MV equals PQ. Money supply times times velocity equals price times quantity, and that price means the average level of prices. So anytime the money supply increases or the rate at which the typical dollar is spent, 
or alternatively, the amount of money that people seek to hold in their cash balances uh, on average falls, you'll have inflation, assuming, uh, assuming the quantity of output in the economy stays remains relatively yeah. stable. Basically, it's, it, it's an equation with four variables, MV equals PQ. I learned that MV equals PT, where T is the yeah, number yeah, of transactions. Yeah. It's the same idea. Yeah. So if you move one and you can hold the others constant, Something has to change. It's not even an equation. It's an identity. It should yeah. be MV three lines, right. <laughs> you know, uh, PQ. MV is the same as PQ by the way these things are defined. But if M goes up, there's three other things that could change, V, yes. P, or Q. And often we say, assuming V and Q don't change, then, P's then got P it. has to move one to one in correspondence with changes in M. And usually, barring any real effects, which we'll get back to later, I'm sure, that would be true. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no reason to think people are going to change their desire to hold cash balances. If there's no reason that productivity is, hasn't changed in the period of time we're talking about, then all monetary changes will be reflected in price changes. Right. And, the, and, and so taking off from that. And this goes back to Irving Fisher, by the way, I think. Did yeah. it go back earlier than that? I well, I mean, Freeman certainly attributes it to, to Irving Fisher. I think, I, I don't know for a fact, I think Irving Fisher uh, is properly credited with having first formulated the equation of exchange. But I, I could be wrong on that. Um, it was certainly form- – Milton Friedman is not the, form- is not the person not who Friedman formulated – but he, he is the person who conducted the most extensive empirical studies uh, that, that – Convince people that – Yeah, as much as evidence in the social sciences can convince people. You know, the, the, the Friedman statement – again, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon – I think was meant to – uh, 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 discredit the notion of cost push yeah. inflation. This is one of these many notions that uh, non that, that, that non economists have that are pretty widespread in the economy. It's on a par with um, uh, you know t- tariffs can increase employment at home. That inflation is caused by higher prices. Well, inflation is higher prices, and the thing can't cause. Itself, and by the way, it's not just a political thing. A lot, you, you, I'll hear a lot of con, you know cons, people with, of conservative or free market bent saying, "Well, you know, one of the problems with minimum wage laws is that they cause inflation." You know, and there are a lot of problems with minimum wage legis- statutes, but they cause inflation is not not one of them. They do. They can raise the price potentially of goods that are produced predominantly by low skill labor. That's not inflation. That's not inflation. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you have you have these. It's possible to posit a very small distant effect that to the extent that minimum wage legislation or um, some other regulations uh, reduce the effic- operating efficiency of the economy, well, it reduces output, and therefore, you know, that, that tends to... It's a small... It's a small... Yeah, it's yeah, small. yeah, yeah. Uh, the, 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 the idea that, that you raising the price that you charge me for whatever it is you sell to me can spark inflation because I will therefore then have to raise the price at which I resell the product to my customers, that that will cause a general sustained increase in all prices is ludicrous. Because if you don't have enough money, if you don't have any more money to spend and you spend more on one thing and you have less on another, then that's just the way it is. You can't. That's right. And and, and therefore, keep in mind, I think, I don't remember exactly when Friedman wrote that line. But it's in a lecture I think he gave in India in the late 50s. I think it is from the late 50s. Yeah. And Friedman spent um, a good deal of time uh, fighting. And fortunately, we don't, I don't think yet we have to fight this battle again, um, although we may. Friedman spent a lot of time fighting the notion of uh, what I think then called incomes policies. Right. Uh, policies, say, well, well, inflation is uh, rising prices. It's a problem. So let's just outlaw it. And so we had price controls. Uh, we, we had them in, in the United States. Um, and if you understand, if, if, if inflation truly is caused by someone, for whatever reason, raising uh, his or her prices too much, if inflation really is a cost-push phenomenon, then you could potentially really stop it sure. by by price controls. If inflation is not a cost push phenomenon, if it is a demand pull, as they say, phenomenon caused by injecting too much money into the economy, and therefore the nominal demands that people express for goods and services rise because they have more money, outlawing nominal price rises does nothing to 
uh, s- solve the underlying problem. Now, here's an interesting issue. If you define inflation as a general increase in the price level, that's the, def- that's the definition that we use, and that is the definition we use today. Price controls are great. Then price solve controls, it. They, end the problem. They, they solve <laughs> the, the problem in a very uh, literal way, um, but they obviously don't solve the underlying problem. Issue. The underlying issue is that the value of money relative to the goods and services that people want to buy is falling. Yeah. Price controls do nothing to solve that problem. In <laughs> fact, it makes it worse because it makes the supply of goods and services less. Friedman, uh, Friedman. I, I loved Friedman's, I, mean, I love yeah, Friedman's uh, example of, you know, this is back in the era before, uh, this is back in the era when, when people use a lot of Fahrenheit, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, um, mercury thermometers. Yeah. You know, Just a second of the exact same story. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. And, and Freeman said, well, you know, if, 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 if to, to, to talk about inflation as if it's a cost push phenomenon and we can solve it by price controls, it's the equivalent of thinking that, that uh, the heat in a room is caused by uh, the thing we use to measure the heat, the thermometer. And so the room's getting kind of hot, you know, and so said, yeah, it's getting kind of hot. Let's, 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 let's solve the problem. And so rather than turn down the heat, rather than stop pumping out the hot air that's causing the room to heat up, what you do is you walk over to that thermometer and you take a, a very sharp metal plate and you stick it in the thermometer at 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And you don't and, and that prevents the mercury from rising high. And you say, ha, we've yeah, solved the it's problem. A comfortable room, 72 yeah. degrees. Yeah, and it's it's a great it's a great analogy because of course you haven't solved the problem. And to the extent that there's a thermostat attached to the thermometer. You've made the problem worse because now there's no feedback at all. You keep getting all this, this, this you, the, the hot air pumped into the room. People get hotter and hotter. And those people who rather naively focus only on the measured temperature by looking at the thermometer, they think, oh, everything's, everything's Great, fine and solid. dandy. While everybody, of course, is you know, sweating, sweating like pigs and yeah. uh, suffering. So – before we go on, and, we're, and what I want to turn to next is the issue of whether we should worry about inflation or deflation. Um, and we'll, we'll get to deflation in a little bit too, which we haven't mentioned explicitly. I want to ask you about the aggregate aggregation question that that comes up here. We're talking about the average level of prices. And the way it's – there's two issues here, one of which is definitional again and, and somewhat conceptual, and the other is much more conceptual. The definitional idea is that inflation isn't just a one-time increase in the price level. It's an ongoing, I think you used the word sustained, mm-hmm. meaning a continuing rise, meaning a continuing increase in the average level of prices. If prices just went up once and stopped, there's technically some kind of inflation over that little period over which it happened. But when we're talking about inflation, usually in a, in a modern economy, be it uh, Germany in, in the 1920s, the United States in the 70s or any time recently uh, in modern American economic history, or we're talking about extremes like Zimbabwe, uh, what we're talking about is an ongoing perpetual increase. And, and that means there's an ongoing continuing expansion of the monetary uh, – usually the money supplies, not always, but usually of the money supplies as you point out. Um, but the question I want to ask is the way that usually gets measured – the way we assess how serious an inflation problem is out there is we go out and we measure prices. We take a bunch of goods, uh, which and this is inherently a statistical problem. You, you don't go can't measure every good. Um, every you know there's there's you can't even measure the price of apples. You have to talk about the price of certain kind of apples, not just and I don't mean just delicious apples. You have to have delicious apples of a certain crispness and and. Well, in principle, you, you have to do it you have to buy, by location and, and, and by, by time of – When you bought of it the, and how yeah. convenient it was to yeah. buy it and what other amenities were with it. So it's an approximation uh, and I, the Austrian and me and you and I both have a little or a lot. Of, it's irrelevant how much but we all – both of us have, have some Austrian in us. Um, they don't like aggre- – Austrian economics was against the idea of aggregates. Aren't we playing – making the same – error that, that Austrians often complain about when we talk about the price level, as if there's a single good. Because in practice, what has to actually happen in a modern economy to measure inflation 
is you have to measure the price level at a point in time, compare it to the price level at a previous point in time, and then continue to do that and see that the price level is growing at some relatively constant or perhaps erratic rate. And to do that, you've got to sample a whole bunch of products of a particular quality in one point in time, come back a year later or six months later and do it again, and continue to do that. And you talk about the average price level, typically in America, the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, as if there was an average. It is a weighted mm-hmm. aggr- It's a weighted average of all the measured goods that the Bureau of Labor Statistics samples. Is that a meaningful idea? Wow, what a big question. Um, well, we've but, got but, 40 minutes, well, roughly, let me, let me, yeah, let and me, I'd like to spend some time on begin, something else. Let me so. begin by, yeah, but, well, yeah, it won't take 40 minutes. Let me begin by saying that I mean, this issue uh, points out why it is regrettable that the older definition of inflation is, is no longer used, because the older definition of inflation does a lot to get around that problem. The older definition of inflation says, you know, inflation is an increase in the money supply, and then what happens to the price level after that is a separate you know, it's kept, it's kept theoretically distinct. Uh, but, you know, that, that's not the definition we have anymore. And so, uh, you, you know, it's not quite, it's, it's not correct to say that, you know, Austrians or, let's, let's not even aggregate that, Hayek <laughs> or you or me are opposed to aggress. I, I quite joyfully draw supply and demand curves on chalkboards, still chalkboards, uh, all the time and talk about, I actually use apples. You know, that's my typical example, the apple market. And I do mention to students, look, you know, obviously there's not, there's more than one kind of apple, but, but you, you, you can get the idea. Useful theoretical it, concept. Yeah. You understand things. Right. The, the, the issue is, uh, ag- using concepts that in, and it, judgments required and maybe different from person to person using concepts um, that in, uh, enlighten us, or that, that g- give, help give us better understanding, as opposed to concepts that hide uh, important forces that, were they visible to us, would get a better understanding of the economy. Austrians uh, are famous, I think rightly so in this case, for objecting to the Keynesian aggregates, uh, Aggregate demand, aggregate supply, uh, capital in the economy as this K. Yeah. Um, labor is L. Labor is L. Uh, consumption. We're not talking about what the choice, what letter to use. The idea no, no. that that yeah. you could talk about the supply of labor with right. a capital L, meaning yeah. that it's all the same. So if there's excess supply of labor, you have unemployment. As if there isn't some markets, labor markets that are highly tight where there's not excess uh, supply. Yeah, and 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 I I I believe that those aggregates hide, but by focusing on those aggregates, the analyst blinds him or herself to the more important uh, 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 microeconomic um, adjustments that either are or or would take place in the absence of of, of government intervention. Uh, talking about the average level of prices. At one level, I think it's perfectly fine. Right? We, we, we understand that, uh, that uh, you know, there, there are prices for apples, there are prices for automobiles, there are, there's prices per square foot of, of housing, there are prices for cups of coffee, for sugar. And we, all, we can make a distinction between those prices rising uh, uh, it, 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 more or less in unison as dis- uh, and caused with price increases are caused – not by changes in underlying real economic uh, factors, resource constraints, consumer demands, but instead simply by the, me- the changes in the supply of the medium of exchange used to purchase them. Um, the, the more sp- specific we get with attempts to actually measure the average level of prices, you know, that's where problems come in. I have no problem with the concept of the average level of prices. I, I don't no. think I don't think I don't think it hides. I think it illuminates when used in the, the equation of exchange. It illuminates more than it hides. It enables us to understand what happens when the supply of money increases. 
I mean, the supply of money itself is in, in some ways an aggregate Absolutely. concept, sure. right? Uh, is, Many we're different just, kinds. There's yeah, yeah, all, you know, M1 versus M2. When I remember when I was in, grad, when, in graduate school back in, back in the early 80s, it was a big debate. So uh, M1, right, M2, right M3. Um, what's, uh, what's money right. at all? Yeah, you can't do any kind of analysis uh, without abstracting away from individual differences. And, and it, 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 a lot of people take cheap shots at Austrians by saying, well, you know, you people are opposed to aggregates, and, and therefore, you know, but look, you talk about supply over here or the money supply over there, and therefore you're a hypocrite. Right? That's not it at all. Uh, it, the, 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 the issue is to, to, to do your analysis at a level and use your concepts at a level that enlighten rather than, than, than hide. I truly believe the Keynesian aggregates hide uh, more than they enlightened. Now, having said that, uh, I, I, I believe that the Chicago view of the Chicago money macro theory uh, is also a little bit too dependent upon um, uh, aggregates that hide rather than aggregates that enlighten. The typical Chicago discussion, Milton Friedman is even guilty of this, typical Chicago discussion of inflation when, it's, when people discuss the, co- the problems of inflation, they talk about, well, you know, the, 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 the distribution, the, the, the uh, 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 wealth redistribution that inflation has from creditors to debtors. Um, and, but I think that the, the in, effects of inflation, particularly the process of, of, of increasing the money supply, uh, does have effects on relative prices that are ignored, unfortunately, by otherwise really insightful monetary theorists at Chicago. Well, we'll come back to that maybe. Um, as a Chicago economist mm-hmm. with some Austrian in him, I'm, I'm sort of conflicted by this part of the conversation, but I'll, maybe I'll – We'll resolve the conflict. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe I'll, I'll come, come around later. The, the thing I want to mention, I, I like what you said about you know, that obviously you have to abstract – an aggregate, by definition, is some level of abstraction from reality. You can't model or analyze the world in its most minute detail. So by definition, almost any type of theorizing has to have that kind of simplification. Yeah. Um, having said that, my caveat would be that our attempts to measure the level of inflation with any precision is fraught with problems because of quality changes. And that's a subject for another podcast that I hope we will get to down the road. Do that with Michael Boskin. Yeah, yeah. I'll see what I can do. Um Let's turn to the harm and and potential benefit. I don't see any, but uh, the harm and potential benefit of inflation and deflation. One of the most remarkable commonly held views that I hear all the time, which I find bizarre, is the idea that inflation is good, a little inflation is good, and a little deflation is bad. Here's the reason. A little inflation – well. Actually, before I do the, before I give you the what I think is a fallacy, let me let's talk about the rea- what's more about the truth. Why is inflation and deflation? Why are they why are they bad if they are? Well, um, in, in, the, the, in fact, the, the, as opposed the, or in theory the, at least. The, and, you know, we were fallacy. talking before you, you turned on the the, the recording machine, and there is, have, you have, it is important to distinguish between uh, uh, in, uh, anticipated and unanticipated inflation. Um, unanticipated inflation is even worse than anticipated inflation. Uh, if, if I want to borrow money from you, uh, then if we both anticipate that the rate of inflation, correctly anticipate the rate of inflation will be, say, 10%, then I'm willing to pay, um, uh, say, thir- a 13% rate of interest, 10% to account for the fact that I'll be paying, repaying you in money worth 10% less, 3% real rate of return. You will demand a at least a 13% nominal rate of interest from me. And so if we anticipate... Just, the, I'm just going to correct... But note that, oh. meaning if, if there were no inflation, let's suppose that I would charge you 3%, 3% percent to borrow yeah, my money and yeah. use it, and I wouldn't have it for that year. I wouldn't have the opportunity right. to do anything with it. Right. If we both ag- agree that the dollars that you're going to pay me back are going to buy 10% less yes. because the average level of prices is 10% higher, then I'm going to ask for 13% instead of 3 And I do want to add one more. And I'd be willing to pay it. And you'd be happy to pay it. And I'm going to add one more caveat about about aggregation, which is, of course, the bundle of goods that I buy is not the average. Yeah. The bundle of goods you buy is not the average. And that's another sense in which the aggregation is sloppy. Yeah. Uh, but, again, we're talking about the general effects here to understand the underlying economics. Yeah. And Carry so, I mean, that, 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 that's a problem 
with inflation. Um, so if it weren't anticipated, it, you naively, I naively lent you the money, or, inc- or not naively, just without you foresight. You lent it to me 3%, 3% in this 10% rate of inflation. I'm going to get punished. You're going to have a, you got a windfall. I got, I got hurt. Right. And that you don't be, even get, you don't even receive your, your full principal back in real purchasing power, much less a return for having, uh, undergoing the risk of lending to me and, 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 and foregoing whatever consuming. I would have done with the money. So if I gave you a hundred, you may give me back your later 103 and that's going to buy less than a hundred dollars worth of that's right. goods because of the in, ensuing inflation. It'll buy the amount of goods. It'll buy less than, than I, than I started with the year before. Right. So that, but that's just, we call that a distributional effect in economics right. by itself. It, it's unfair in some dimension, but I think that I think by far the most dangerous consequences of inflation go well, well, Beyond that, even fully anticipated inflation, by, by which I mean fully anticipated and accurately anticipated changes in however we define the general price level, are dangerous. And, and dangerous for reasons we can't avoid it now, why, for, why, for reasons that Chicago economists uh, overlook. Uh, inflation is not uh, created by helicopters hovering above, distributing money evenly and proportionally. Money is injected into the economy at certain points. Um, and uh, wherever it's injected, it causes those prices to rise first. And, and as the money works its way through the system, then it causes those other prices to rise. So it causes, it causes a, uh, it, uh, 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 distortions in relative prices. Now, when people make economic decisions, we, we, there is no price level to look at Right? Were well, you deciding whether you're going to buy uh, an extra gallon of gasoline or an extra gallon of milk? Are you going to build a house or not? Um, whether you're going to, to, to borrow money uh, either for business or commercial or, or consumer reasons? You look at it. We look at relative prices. If relative prices are being distorted by changes in the money supply, that leads people in the economy to make decisions that they would otherwise not make and that they shouldn't make were the relative prices more accurately reflective of the true uh, resource scarcities and consumer demands that are out there in the economy. And so people misdirect resources. Resources get misallocated. And this is part of the Austrian business cycle theory. Yeah. We've talked about it in a, in a couple of, of past podcasts. Um, yeah. Of course, and, you could argue. I mean, and so, so, it's, so it's not so much the rise in general price level that's harmful. It's the process by which – the rise in the general price level gets sparked. Well, that's one harm, and yeah. that's a subtle harm. I, I would argue I think that, it's a major harm. Well, I would argue that uh, I don't disagree with it. I, I think there, there are two things I think they are important to add. One is, you know, Friedman talks a lot about, you know, you see more people coming into your store. You don't know whether it's because your product's more popular right. or right. because the Fed's been misbehaving. Right. Um, and so... I think he was aware, certainly he was aware in, in the intuitive sense of these kind of issues mm-hmm. at the micro level. What I, what the, my, my real complaint about your, your observation about the harm is that certainly that is a harm that is real. The distortionary effect is real. It's difficult to measure. We would say it's, it's smaller at low levels of inflation than it is at high levels of inflation. Sure. And it may cause some listeners to miss another harm that we, I think, both Austrians and Chicagoans would agree on, which is if inflation is large enough and erratic enough, mm-hmm. and in, inherent when we, it, it, it's a little bit of hand waving to say, well, if it's anticipated, of course, it's never really fully anticipated. You don't, right. to the extent well, that it's anticipated, let's say you might, I might be confident that there's going to be higher prices a year from now than. Than, than today, but if it's going to be forty percent higher versus four percent higher, yeah. I'm making it. We're going to make all kinds of mistakes in our in our allocation of right. of resources. But in particular, when there is so-called hyperinflation, which is high levels of inflation, which we haven't seen in the United States in our lifetime, we're talking now about Germany, World War One, Germany, Germany and the Weimar Republic, Hungary, in World War Two, yeah, Zimbabwe recently. These are cases where. The level of inflation is rising fast enough that people stop – they're unable to use money as a medium of exchange anymore, and we go to a barter economy. Yeah. And I think you know somewhere between 
inflation and 100% a week, uh, which everyone agrees is hyperinflation, 3% a year everyone agreed is, is a, quote, low level. Along that continuum of 3 to 100, 3 a year to 100 a, uh, a week or 100 a month, that is from a lowish level to a very high level, all along there, there's going to be some – distortion of the decision of how much cash and liquidity mm-hmm. to hold in your portfolio of mm-hmm. assets versus how much to keep in the form of goods. And when it gets up to 100 uh, a week, 100%, when prices are doubling every week, and it's not, again, not even regularly doubling, you're not quite sure what's going on. It's just you know that money is losing its value extremely rapidly. You get out of money and you get into uh, yeah. hog uh, pigs and chicken and corn and stuff you can carry around and put in your truck and – you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, they, I, you know, we all heard, most of us have heard the stories, and I, I think I even recall seeing pictures, still pictures, of uh, workers in Germany at yeah, the height of the hyperinflation. Yeah, they were getting paid um, two or three times a day in cash, and they would literally roll wheelbarrows full of cash to the factory gates so their wives could get this cash and then rush to the st- to the stores in order to purchase. To buy sooner rather than later. To buy it, sooner rather than later. And so clearly that is a, uh, a you know, a you a, a, a miss. <laughs> A, a waste of resource, an unnecessary waste of resources. You know, your workers taking time off work to just deliver their their b- bundles of cash to their wives. Um, people are not able the wrong, not able to plan. Buying the wrong things because you got to you buy anything you buy just anything. to have it in the form of, that, of physical right. good. That's right. And, and and obviously as inflation as inflation increases in 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 severity, um, the 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 harm that it causes. Increases in severity. It's not linear. It's not a linear increase. It gets it gets disproportionately worse until the eco- entire economy breaks down into barter, which is catastrophic, of course. Well, uh, but I want to mention some research done along these lines, or along the lines I was mentioning earlier. Not in Austrian at all, but the is, uh, Israeli economist Alex Zuckerman uh, did a fair amount of research back in the eighties and I believe early nineties uh, on the empirical research on the relationship between inflation and what he called the dispersion of relative prices. And, and he found clear evidence. So, some of this was published, by the way, in, in the Brookings Review and uh, other journals. He found, Zuckerman found clear evidence that the higher the rate of inflation, the greater the dispersion of relative prices. Um, and so that I've always taken that to be uh, empirical evidence of at least one part of, of the Austrian theory of the trade cycle, inflation does not cause all prices to rise uh, at the same time. If it did, then right. you, the dispersion of relative prices would be unaffected by inflation, and the only thing we'd have to worry about is, you know, to what extent is inflation anticipated or not, and so we get redistribution of of, of, of income from uh, debtor from creditors to debtors, and you know, it, it affects the willingness of people to. So the uncertainty affects the willingness of people to, to lend uh, credit or to, to, to borrow productively it also on credit. Very but, destructive. Yeah, but but there is there is a good deal of empirical research that inflation um, distorts relative prices. No, I'm yeah. sure I'm sure it does. The yeah. question is, you know, how important is it for causing the business cycle? Exactly. And other, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that and, that, and our this research being, doesn't answer that. Being inaccurate, you know, is a, clearly a cost. Um, so let's turn now to deflation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I said I was going to give an example of what I think is a, f- a fallacious argument, and I want to use your uh, German wheelbarrow story to do it. I hear all the time, meaning more than once, <clears throat> it's close enough, my empirical study. I've heard more than once, which is surprising. I've heard smart people say more than once, oh, well, inflation's good. It's deflation that's bad. And we've just told a bunch of stories about why inflation is bad. I've heard that bad. often too. So. But l- let me give you the what I hear is the s- standard argument for why inflation is good and deflation is bad. It's a bizarre argument in the sense that it requires a Keynesian argument underlying it that is clearly wrong I- as a general rule. The argument is this. Here's why inflation is good. See, with inflation, prices are going up, so you buy now rather than later. And that's good because people are encouraged to spend. And so underlying this fallacy, in my, in my view, is that spending is good and not spending is, is, is bad, which I think is strange uh, and, and silly, as, as if the entire mechanism of the economy and our exchanges with each other and our cooperation has to be driven by our, our nominal spending, which is a strange idea. It's not 
real. Um, the underlying reality, real economic forces are ignored. But but your story illustrates it. So the standard argument is – so inflation is good because that encourages people to spend. But with deflation, because it's always going to be cheaper eventually because prices are falling, you just – you don't buy anything. You just wait. Now, it's, it's, it's wrong on it. many, many faces. Obviously, people buy plenty of stuff when the price is going down. It's like saying you'll, no one will ever buy a cell phone. Because it just kept getting cheaper. So you just keep waiting. It's a ridiculous now, it, argument. It, that's obviously false. People buy TVs because they'd rather have it now than yeah. later. Yeah. It's true. It'll be cheaper eventually, but you don't get to enjoy the TV. Yeah. So they Go buy it. Go into Best Buy now. You see a lot of people buying computers <laughs> even though the price enough. is going to fall. Even though they're conf- even they're not ignorant, those people. They're they, not, they know you don't, nearly 100% <laughs> certainty the price will be cheaper <laughs> six months from now. Then, Lower, yeah. so, so that argument I found strange, but – just the logic of it is strange, but let's get at the underlying economics behind the argument, which to me is even stranger. It's like saying Zimbabwe or Germany in 1923 or Hungary after World War II or Germany after World War II, I think, also had the same problem. Those are the greatest economies of all time because there was so much inflation. People were spending with such frenzy and, and were so hurried to spend their money that that multiplier kept – well, of course, that's nonsense. That doesn't create real wealth. That creates real nom- that creates nominal spending, mm-hmm. but not prosperity. It creates measured nominal increases, which have nothing to do with your standard of living. In fact, it's the opposite. Right. The faster you're out spending, the less time you had to, to be productive and creative, and the economy was getting poorer because of that inflation, not richer. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I, I, I agree. I hear this all the time as well, uh, that, that in it, and it reflects, um, and it's particularly egregious among economists who say it reflects, uh, I'll say first, an appalling uh, lack of understanding, a, a lack of familiarity with even basic economic history. Infl- def- deflation, defined as we define it now, a, a sustained decline in the decline in the general price level. Deflation marked the U.S. economy for its last thirty for the last 30 years of the 19th century. In each of those years, the general price level either remained the same or more often fell. As best as we can measure it. As best as, yep. we, as, best as we can measure But the same is whole true for you know, sure. now. As best we can. And, so, and, and, and so what, was, what happened then was the United States, for better or worse, was on a gold standard. Not a perfect gold standard, but on a gold standard. The money supply was not very elastic as, as a consequence. Uh, productivity in the economy was rising, ro- rose dramatically. So outputs increased. So we had this, pretty much the same amount of money chasing far more goods. And so the value of money relative to the larger number of goods continued to increase from Means prices were falling from the late 1860s until the very uh, the first year or two of the 20th century. So prices fell. So here we have an economy. That was one of the great success stories of all of human history, the last three decades of the 19th century. Yeah, they had, you know, they had you know, some recessions, and, but you know, nothing like we had in the 20th century. Um, well, 1894 but, was pretty bad, but it, I think it was relatively not, not short. Not like the 1930s. No, that's right. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, uh, so the last uh, – you know, the post-Civil uh, War American economy uh, up – until the begin, turn of the 20th century, was by and large a hugely successful economy. It was one in which deflation was, was the, the norm. Right? Right. Now, how can you say an economy cannot prosper uh, when there's deflation? Un- unless you argue that we've measured it completely, mis- you resort to them, well, the measurements were wrong, we really had inflation. I've never heard anyone make that argument. And so just here we, I have one really big empirical fact. Late 19th century America, economically successful, deflation. Um, right now, and then to you know, counter that with the examples you gave about inflation, uh, post-World War I Germany, uh, you know, m- modern-day Zimbabwe, a lot of inflation, not much success. Oh, and and by the way, add- and those arguments, those arguments they're, they're even more uh, illogical than, than you suggest. All the arguments you, you gave are, are correct. They only look at one side of the argument. They, they, they take the inflation. Well, the, with inflation, uh, people will want to buy now because, you know, the uh, price will be high tomorrow. Well, I don't know. It's at, at, at buyers. Sellers have the opposite effect. They'll, they'll say, no, 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 I don't want to sell now because no. prices are going to be higher tomorrow. And, and the opposite is true with deflation. Right? And so 
this is it's this is just sloppy, sloppy thinking. I'm going to add one more fallacy to the pile, which is this idea that um, uh, you can't have. Uh, again, I hear it all the time now, despite the historical evidence. You can't have inflation and unemployment going together because if you have inflation, there's all this money circulating. People are going to try to spend it, and that'll increase the demand for goods, and that'll workers will get put back to work because because they're going to be expanding production. I have one word for you. Yeah. 1970s. Yeah, well, the 70s in the United States, obviously we had uh, high rates of inflation, high rates of unemployment. Zimbabwe, again, is another example, or Germany. In the, yeah. Any time, hyperinflation doesn't, isn't, aren't, is not associated with, with the highest levels of employment. It's actually the opposite. It's a, a breakdown in the economic system. Now, you could certainly salvage the argument with, say, well, at certain rates or whatever, but, but as a general principle, it's clearly not true. Let me go back to deflation. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the uh, 2008 financial crisis, which we're still in the, in the middle of in many senses, uh, the worry was that we could have deflation. Right. This was a justification by the Federal Reserve and Chairman Bernanke to uh, expand the Fed's balance sheet, which it did dramatically. It is the current justification partly – Again, these are the public justifications. I don't know what the real justifications are, but these are the ones publicly said. We have to do these things, the Fed said, because if we don't, we're at risk of deflation. And you hear a lot of people screaming when when inflation hawks worry that the Fed's policies, when the money that they've been pumping into the banks is actually then injected into the economy as opposed to being held by the banks. Right now, the banks are sitting on it. The money's not being injected into the economy. For those of you out there wondering if inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, why hasn't the Fed's expansion of the money supply led to inflation? The standard answer is because the banks have not done anything with it. Once they do, the presumption is the money supply increases will then translate into into price increases. But those of us who are worried about that are told, you're fools. Inflation is the last thing we need to worry about. We have to worry about deflation. Mm-hmm. And the worry, as I understand it, and I want your reaction, the worry is that unlike the deflation of the late 19th century in the United States, which was driven by productivity increases and a relatively fixed money supply, mm-hmm. what we're facing now is if there was – and that was a world, by the way, that we have never lived in, in the United States today, that people alive today have never experienced. Most of us in America who are alive today have experienced – Mild, steady inflation, mm-hmm. uh, steady increases in the price level mm-hmm. of you know zero to five percent. Most of our, in recent history, mod- what we call modest inflation. Many of us, most of us, have never, none of us alive today, have lived through steady deflation. And as a result, the claim is is that because we've not experienced that, we have no anticipation of that. We've made a lot of contracts in nominal terms. Almost all – most of contracts are nominal terms. They're, I'll give you $1,000 today uh, and you'll pay me back the $1,030 uh, in, um, in a year. year. Yeah. And so if deflation occurred and as a result, if wages started to fall alongside prices, which often happens when they move mm-hmm. in tandem – then you would find yourself having made promises in nominal terms to, without an inflation adjustment that you'd be unable to, to, to make. So you'd be unable to make the mortgage payment on your house. This would make our foreclosure problem even worse. Uh, banks who've been expecting certain inflows of cash would find themselves unable to, uh, meet, to, to receive those funds, and banks would become more likely to become insolvent. That would, could further exacerbate the problem of deflation as banks start to retract, uh, their at, bring their assets in, and, and try to salvage their balance sheets. So the claim is, is that a little bit of deflation could be extremely destructive if it's unanticipated, unlike, say, the period of 1870-1900, where that was a world people were used, got used to living in and made their contracts presumably in, in nominal terms, being aware of the fact that prices were likely to fall over the next year. Do you think there's anything to this argument about deflationary fears? Well, there are always a, there are always adjustment costs. I mean, there are, are adjustment issues. Um, I I wouldn't deny that uh, when the monetary the Fed, our monetary authority, uh, shifts its its uh, 
um, it's op- the way it operates to change the to, to change the likely course of the value of money over the future compared to what people have expected that some people will make decisions that turn out in retrospect to be wrong and decisions that uh, had the original monetary policy not changed they would not have these people would not have made but that argument cuts uh, way too way too broadly I mean it, the same argument could be it could have been used against, say, Paul Volcker's famous October 1979 decision to change the the, the Fed's target policy, a decision that was credited with reducing inflation from the double digits that it had reached in the in the late 1970s, early 1980s, to the much more moderate, you know, three four percent that it reached uh, a few years later. Um, now, you, you know, following that monetary policy. The economy did go into a fairly deep recession in the early 1980s. Part of the problem may have been people were making decisions based upon their previous expectations of inflation that that proved to be uh, wrong. But what do we do? We, we do if, just because the Fed's pursuing a mistaken policy today or an unwise policy today, we don't say, "Well, well we, we can't stop this unwise policy because people are expecting us to continue this unwise policy." And so, heavens, uh, <laughs> uh, we, we 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 couldn't impose that cost on people. I, I, the, the, the problem is you started, you, the Fed, started with this unwise policy. Right? That's part of the problem of an unwise policy. It, it creates bad expectations. Well, well, what if it's not the Fed's policy? What if well, – Whoever let's take, policy. Well, let's take the, let's take the 1930s mm-hmm. where we recently had Doug Irwin on, on the program talking about the role of, the of falling prices and, and monetary policy mm-hmm. that France may have – played an important role in precipitating the worldwide depression and mm-hmm. why and how because they were hoarding gold imposing price decreases on foreign on their on other nations and that that helped precipitate the the, the great depression and certainly Friedman and others have argued that that the US Fed for whatever reason that there was deflation mm-hmm. whether it was France's gold policies or other reasons mm-hmm. should have responded by being more aggressively uh, expansionary mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it seems to me that deflation driven by monetary changes can be very destructive and is something to worry about, or do you disagree? Oh, deflation driven by monetary change? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, there's no, there's no reason that I can think of to, um, um, to either actively pursue or even to allow the money supply to contract uh, it, it, it's that's uncalled for. That will create problems. And the, but uh, that can now, happen because of yes, that's right. Decisions that's right. That mean, be, that, yeah, under not, a gold standard, it can happen because there's yes an increase in the demand for gold for for real purposes uh, of the shutting of a gold mine that wasn't anticipated. Yes, yeah, it, it doesn't have to be a Fed blunder. A Fed blunder, right? Um, but that that kind of deflation caused by monetary Policy, either monetary policy by commission or monetary policy by omission, that kind of uh, deflation is fundamentally different from deflation caused by increases in the economy's productivity. Why? Uh, well, because when when the 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 money supply is in the latter case, when defl- when the economy imp- becomes more productive and more. Goods and services get produced, say, per hour of human labor. You have more goods. Innovation. Right. Um, then the the money supply is not being mucked, mucked around with. Right. And uh, uh, the ability to calculate and contract in prices is much stronger than when the money supply itself is decreased. I'm sure that's true. I mean, I mean, it certainly doesn't seem to me to be true. Uh, let me let me let me let me set this up a little differently. When the economy is improving, mm-hmm. uh, when we're becoming more productive, to bring this full circle with our earlier conversation, it doesn't get equally better at an equal rate in all pro- in all goods. Right. Some mm-hmm. goods are innovations at a very fast pace, say electronics. Uh, in our modern world, and in some, the pace of innovation is sure, very slow, sure. such as our field, education, where 
because it's very labor intensive, it's very hard to get the kind of Moore's law type improvements that are driving the the, the lowering falling co- prices of, of electronic goods. I still so, use chalk. That's what the Greeks used what? in ancient Athens. I still use chalk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, although um, you know, the whiteboard's a huge technological leap forward, no, I don't like and join yeah. us. Um, so the innovations that are say improving our standard of living. And, and let's start with the yeah, simplest case. Even, right. Let's yeah. start with the simplest case where monetary um, monetary aggregate, however we define it, is is relatively constant. So there's no changes in the money supply. All the changes in prices being driven by innovation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is the earlier example you mm-hmm. yeah, used yeah, yeah, yeah. in the 1870s period onward, where relatively fixed money supply, productivity increases at varying rates at different parts of the economy leading to lower prices, but changes in relative prices all the time because some goods are getting cheaper at a faster rate than others because they're innovating at a faster rate in those industries. And what we'd observe is the average level would be falling, relative price would be changing, signaling that to encourage people to buy more of the things that had gotten even more ch- cheap due to innovation and economizing relatively on the things that hadn't gotten as cheap as quickly. And that's all good. And our purchasing power would increase. Our standard of living would increase. Now, that's case one. Case two is there's a, a change in the supply of gold for whatever reason that suddenly causes prices to fall at non-uniform um, rates across the economy because the gold changes are going to ripple through it, as, as the Austrians are correct about, at different rates. Now, in that case, that second case, our real standard of living would not be rising. We would not have larger command over goods and services, Mm -hmm. right? But in both cases, would we not have the same borrowing uh, lender-creditor issues that I talked about earlier that alarm people about deflation if they were not anticipated? If they were anticipated, certainly both cases would would be relatively unimportant. Right, right. Um, and the, the real issue, it seems to me, is whether financial institutions are going to be have extra stress because of these falling prices because of past promises that have been made in nominal dollars, nominal contracts. It, look, if people if people want to people want to hold a certain um, portion of their assets in money, and if the monetary authority or whatever Liquid force um, uh, starts contracting. The supply of money, people are going. People are going to uh, reduce their spending in order to increase their the size of their money balances. That it would be an unnecessary um, shock to the economy, and I don't see the same kind of shock occurring when the money supply stays relatively constant, but the supply of goods and services in the economy increases because of productivity increases in the economy. George or Larry, George Selgin or Larry White would have been better on, particularly George Selgin on this, on this uh, issue. He could explain the difference between, uh, which we call it, uh, demand pull and supply <laughs> push de- de- well, uh, I'll deflation. Ask, um, I'll ask George to, write, to yeah. contribute a comment on it. I'm sure he'll, he'll we, be we, to do if that. We can, if, we, if, if we can link to his his 1997 monograph, Less Than Zero, that would be good. Yeah, we'll do that also. But the the point I'm asking here, I, I, I accept Selgin's point and yours that um, there's a big difference in its – let me say it – I'll try to say it a little more clearly because I asked the question in a very long roundabout way. There's no doubt in my mind that a contraction in the money supply – that leads to deflation is either neutral if anticipated, relatively neutral. I'll say relatively to allow for yeah, the yeah. kind of issues you raised earlier about this transition, the transmission of this through the economy mm-hmm. is relatively neutral or slightly harmful uh, relative to a deflation that is caused by a increase in productivity – where the money supply is held constant. There's no doubt that the, that, that the latter effect of deflation driven by an expansion of productivity and, 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 and more goods being available is 
an increase in our standard of living, and the other one's not. The other right, one is right, just a, right. a punishment of making it harder to figure out what's going on in the world around us. But what what I maybe the point I'm making here is a subtle one, and we'll try to resolve it and get some other opinions. But it seems to me that if it's not anticipated, uh, the effects on borrowers and lenders could have real impacts on financial institutions, which could lead to other real impacts. Before we started the podcast, but those you could have those same. It's true, but those very same issues that you highlight would exist if there's an unanticipated decline in the rate of inflation. If people have been living with, say, the past several years, a, a 10%, more or less steady 10% rate That's of true, too. inflation. That's a good point. And Absolutely. the Fed unexpectedly decreases, in America, the Fed unexpectedly decreases the rate of inflation to 5%. Then you get those same... Nominal contracts. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. I, I think... It's um, not an inflation-deflation issue. This is a, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, and, and I have to say, I'm, I'm trying to understand why fairly sensible people are worried about deflation. Uh, you're right. Those fairly sensible people, when inflation was 15% or 12%, didn't worry about it falling to 5 Maybe they figured that the monetary policies that would lead to that would be seen and maybe anticipated, and I, I don't know. It's, a, it's an interesting question. But we're, we're, we're out of time. I, I, I want to end with – with a quote that you you gave me um, before we started, before we started taping, which was uh, economists like to say that money is a veil, and it, it's not a very helpful, I think, expression for non-economists. What we mean when we say that is that the dollar figures we attach to our activities are not what we really care about. What we really care about is real things, our command over goods and services. So. You know, take a, a wonderful example um, that Mark Twain has in the Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court. If, if you double my wages and you double the prices, I'm not richer. Uh, he's got a very uh, neither richer nor poorer. I'm neither richer nor poorer. But but the the fool in in Twain's dialogue says, "But my income's twice as high." Yeah, I know, but it doesn't buy any more than it did before. Uh, it's hard to to grasp that sometimes. Uh, and if you're an economist and you think about it a relatively large amount, the idea that money is a veil, that that the dollar figures we attach to things are not so important, and it's the real underlying things that matter, both in the sense of what we care about and the sense of what drives our activities and, and what causes things to happen, that that the examples you gave earlier of changes in consumer preferences or changes in innovation and the, therefore falls in the cost of production – those are real. They have real impacts on our and, – and should. Um, but as, as we also know, changes in monetary factors, although often avail, can have real effects. And so you – what was the quote? Uh, well, I, I quoted my former teacher, Leland Yeager, the great um, mon- money banking and international trade theorist, who said that, yes, money is avail, but it is a fluttering veil. And you said the idea is that, that – um, you know, we, for, for, we should look through this veil at, you know, to the real underlying factors that matter. And that's true. But m- money, it's a fl- it, 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 be- because money does have real effects, it flutters. <laughs> and so it distorts our vision mm-hmm. of, of the, the, real, the real economy. So the best policy is to have that veil be as steady as possible, fluttering as little as possible, so that our perception of the real economy, the real consumer demands, real resource constraints, is as accurate as possible and as distorted as little as possible by flutterings in the veil of money. My guest today has been Don Boudreau. Don, thanks for being part of EconTalk. My pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.